Now, even though I have been here several times, I always know it's polite and to be nice to acknowledge the one who invited you to come. So I want to first honor God and acknowledge what a joy it is to have spirit and people of faith just to be connected in that one God who knows us and unites us in the many ways in which we speak. But I also want to acknowledge my colleague and my friend, the Reverend Clinton Crawshaw. It's true that we are colleagues as members of the governing board, and I did come in October of last year and told him he was coming on board. And he would have no more extra time. And I'm just grateful to have, to be in, in community and sharing the business of our denomination with him. But I'm also just grateful to have him as my friend, my friend, my colleague, and my brother in Christ. And I thank you for that as well. I also want to acknowledge and thank my brother. No, who in last month when we were at the People of African Descent Conference in Atlanta, Georgia, talked then about this Juneteenth celebration that was happening here and invited me and wanted me to be a part. And I thought it was next Sunday, but the Lord had it where it was this Sunday, and I'm honored to be here. I thank you for your commitment and your understanding and your commitment to, to Juneteenth and all that it means. And for some of you who wonder, what's she talking about? You'll hopefully know a little bit later as we talk about what is Juneteenth and how that And I just thank you, Jim and Joe and all of you who, if I name you as I've already started, that means I have to name everyone in the church. And my memory is short, but it's all good. And so I just want to thank you for being the people of faith that you are, to invite me and to have me present with you. Will you pray with me? Loving God, thank you that the words of my mouth and the meditation, meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. In your many names I pray. Amen. Amen. Now, it's interesting at this point that I must say that <clears throat> June 10th, or June 19th, June 10th, of 1998 was the first time I ever preached in a metropolitan church. At MCC Los Angeles at the 6 o'clock <coughs> service, I preached my first sermon. Um, at the invitation of Bob, Reverend Barbara Haynes at the 6 o'clock gospel service. Now, I need to let you know it was the first, but when she invited me, she invited me in March, and the date got changed. And then it happened that it was on June 10th of 1998. What is significant about that for me is that it was the first and still is the only time that I wrote my sermon didn't change a word, even though we changed the day. It was the message that was given to me at that time. And it was something entitled at the time, Sex, Lies, and Videotapes, or something of that nature. <laughs> but it was touching to me, I think, of that sort. But the point was for me, it was kind of a calling that one can say from 16 years later that has led me, in, and obviously being here today, the ordination, the whole process, it has changed my life. So it is important to me. And I would be remiss, even though I just realized that my colleague was here, that I do not bring you greetings on behalf of our moderator, the Reverend Dr. Nancy Wilson, and the entire governing board of our delegation. <coughs> I served this year as the vice chair, and I'm just honored to acknowledge just your enthusiasm and just the giving spirit, and just your showing up as you, MCC of the Coachella Valley. I just want to acknowledge that and bring you greetings and acknowledge that fact. But there's one thing I want to not lose as I go back to what's significant about today. It is true that it is trendy, sunny, it's Juneteenth, it's Father's Day, but what I'm going to do different than I did 16 years ago is I'm not going to preach the same sermon. <laughs> it's on a VHS and I didn't have a chance to convert it, so I don't know what it says. <laughs> but more importantly, I want to go back as I touch upon this topic to some fundamental foundational information that will support my sermon title, When Freedom Comes. I want to go back because it was only really yesterday when I was watching Melissa Harris Perry and she was talking with Jim Wallace and there were some issues they were talking about I was reminded when we were talking about the faith community, and I had on some matters that are important to us in the world, immigration and reform and other kind of matters, 
And the question was, what could the faith community do? But there was a fundamental thing that came back that I had to go back to. And I want to offer these fond, fond, foundational three points to you and I that will help us as we go through the next part of the Juneteenth conversation. You see, the first thing I want to support is I am a follower of the teachings of Jesus. And I do believe that the Holy Scriptures, the Bible, the 66 books, are God's entire word. I do not take it literally, but I do it as inspiration. Mm -hmm. The challenge is, of course, sometimes you go in seminary and learn a little Hebrew, it kind of changes your perspective of words, but the truth of it is, it is in the inspired word of God, and it supports my faith and my own teaching as foundational to me. So even in the English language, when I refer to Genesis 1, there's an important foundational thing that's important to you and I. That you and I are made in the image and likeness of God. Amen. Now, it's the binary conversation that does talk to both male and female or equal and made in that image. But more importantly, you got to hold on to something as a person of faith that you and I are made in the image and the likeness of God. How many of you believe that? So there's a gift. You just are. We just are. The second thing that, that comes from me a couple thousand years ago, but that always makes it old, but it's new news, it comes to... What are people of faith supposed to believe? Or what's so important? And I always go to the teachings in Matthew 22. When Jesus was challenged by the Pharisees, as always I understand, you know, we have these laws, we have these rules. You're, you're really directing the people to go against what our, our traditional teachings are. And then there was this test. And the test, in essence, asked, you know, then really what's important and Jesus really told the Pharisees at the time, let me just make it very clear. So it won't be so hard. You know, you want to go laws and rules, Pharisees? Let me just make it simple for you. There's two things that you really need to worry about. The first commandment is what? Love to love God. God. With what? All your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. There you go. The second commandment is what? Love your neighbors as yourself. Love your neighbors. But guess what? As yourself. Some of us sometimes think we should be flip, love ourselves first, and then we can love our neighbors. But that's an important teaching. The order is very important. To love your neighbor as you love yourself. It really does in often ways remind me of what Maya Angelou sometimes talk about, is that people really show you who they are, and they tell you, and they show you believe them. Or again, they will again remind you so much about themselves, so listen and pay attention. So if we believe in those foundational kinds of things, and if you can just work with me on that, it would help the journey as we talk very briefly about particular Juneteenth. Because I think it's important when we talk about freedom in the United States, when we talk about it and what it means to be a free person, that that's the foundational for but what's more important to me that I'm honored to stand here to say, I am the dream and the hope of the slave. Mm -hmm. yes. I rise. I rise. I rise. That's an excerpt that many of you know from Maya, Dr. Maya Angelo, past pioneer woman. That sets a very important foundation that I think helps you and I as we explore that particular peculiar institution. Because I have to acknowledge very simply when we talk about when freedom comes, what really does it mean and why is that so pertinent and important to Juneteenth? Now, for those of you who believe, and as I researched this, I really had to reflect again and again on how much of slavery in the United States that was transported, that was created here by the Europeans was important. And what I'm going to do is go back some 200 and, or 400 years and acknowledge after 240, 250 years of slavery in the United States, very harsh, very harsh institution, institution on a group of people who were brought on the trans and that Atlantic trade into the United States, the labor to be reduced and 
treat it in ways that you and I really don't like to talk about. But I'm not going to do that this Sunday because that would take more time. But what I want to do is start 149 years to, on June 19th. The Emancipation Proclamation was delivered to the slaves in Texas. That it is true that President Lincoln had written and shared the Pro Emancipation Proclamation on January 1st of 1863, but it took to over two and a half years for the slaves in Texas to hear about it in Galveston. You see, it had been effective for some time on January 1st, but it did not reach this group of people until such time. It really took the general, um, sometimes, you know, when you sit in the stories, even after the meeting, it takes on a different, different experience when you kind of live it out. Because sometimes you think it's so long ago, but the truth of it is when it's your soft heart and your own spirit, it takes on a different tone you feel it because you know your ancestors and what all that meant. But Granger, Gordon Granger, brought the news, a Union General, to Galveston and shared it. By that time, there was a minimization of the Confederate soldiers and the slaves who were read this emancipation. And they were told that they were now free. That General, that the President had signed this order and is basically an executive order, number three said, Mm. The people of Texas are informed that important in accordance with the proclamation from the executive of the United States, all slaves are free. This involves an absolute equality of personal rights and rights of property between former masters and slaves, and the connection heretofore existing between them becomes that between employer and hired labor. The free men are advised to maintain, remain quietly at their present homes and work for wages. They are informed that they will not be allowed to collect at the military post and that they will not be supported in idleness either there or elsewhere. So the slaves in Texas heard this information, mostly in the Eastern Park. And then what happens is when you hear this read, I can only imagine, 149 years ago, something happens. When freedom comes, something that you've talked about you dreamed about, you thought about comes, is read, what happens? What do you do? What does that mean in a institution, in a place that has treated you and judged you and called you other names? What happens? <coughs> does it go away? Do you run away from the farm or the plantation? Do you really understand what it is? It just means that the president has issued this order and the truth is not because there was support of you as a slave, but more of a, an affirmation to keep the union together. You are now free. <clears throat> so be free. What do you do? What does that look like? To be free. With all that teachings, with all that doctrine, with all of that physical connection, what does that mean to be free? Well, in the United States, over a period of time, many of you have read in your textbook, perhaps, some of us didn't until we became adults, read later. You know, there was that re Reconstruction period. That was 12 years. And then there was a period of 80 years or so of what we call Jim Crow in the United States, which was <coughs> racial segregation. <coughs> it lasted up to the 1950s. And then what happened is that even after that, we have the Civil Rights Movement of 1964 in the United States that changed some things. And yes, it, 1965 with the Voting Rights Act of, 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 of the United States giving rights to blacks, African Americans, to vote. And then there were other laws that even just last year, 
Section 4 of that Voting yeah. Rights Act was rescinded because it was a formula by which we navigated in the United States about proportional and you know what IDs and other things would again legally allow persons to have the full rights and citizenships. But you see, all of that is human law. And I really did leave out three very important amendments to the Constitution. You see, someone tells you free, that's a voice. But then there was the amendment to, amendment number 13, that abolished slavery. Then there was amendment number 14, that basically was about civil rights partially to human beings. And then there was really amendment number 14, or 15, 14, 15, 15 you have to count sometime, that talk about having that protection to human like laws. But yet, when freedom comes, my point simply to you as people, the question is, what does that really mean? You see, there is something about human beings, and you and I own this, earth, just like even in scripture, that talks about what humans, when they give you freedom, there's some conditions, and what happens is, oftentimes, everyone does not follow the law, the rules. Oftentimes in the United States, it was because there was a profit or a benefit to those who controlled and manipulated the laws. But what I want you to know on the other side is the part that I talked about in the beginning, that God created you and I in God's image, and God had a law for us, and God's laws and commands are very simple. It is really how we treat one another. There's a balance. You see, it was so much of the church experience, and not just black folk, but there were Europeans who worked with the displaced Africans to again abolish slavery, to again to work together as community to re-enter into the world, to re-enter to the United States for work and freedom, had to be taught, to be educated how it is to support one another, to be free people in the United States. So why is that so important to you and I? Is that even today that you and I continue to believe, and I think the key point is that, when we work together as a people, regardless of our race, our gender, our sexual identity, all of those things, we create a better world. And what Juneteenth is about is that, that when we work together as a group of people, that we all benefit, yes. that we all are enhanced, that we all have the love, that we are in that community of God that God had created. Now, I could have made you more depressed than perhaps some of you have <laughs> I really wanted to do that. I have more data than you think. <laughs> but you know, I also know that when I preach in front of certain people, it's important to have your data, that people know that just didn't get it off the internet. <laughs> <laughs> you can make it up yourself. <laughs> what I want us to know out of these experiences and what it means today in the 21st century is this. Jesus asked them, the, the persons, and said, how will we know that you are present? And how do we know that you're still treating me as a whole human? And he in essence said in Matthew 25, you see, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was in prison, you came to visit me. When I was in the hospital and I was sick, you me. What I'm pointing to you is that the, the gift of love, the commandment of love, is stronger than any commandment. And that what is important is that you and I believe that slavery and that we believe that mistreating people is over. And I'm here to tell you in the 21st century it is not. And you ask me how that is, and that you and I will be challenged. It was challenged by you and I with the Trayvon Martin experience. It was challenged by you and I when we listened to Donald Sterling as, again, with that experience with the LA Clippers was challenged to believe that those kind of concepts, that kind of racism was not present. Now, you and I may disagree how the information got leaked. That's a different conversation. But regardless of what was leaked, there is a reality that racism and prejudice is the world. But the, you and I 
have an experience to say, how do we treat people differently? There are so many ways, but I'll just give you a perfect one. Immigration reform mm -hmm. is going to challenge all of us. Yes. Because you and I have a fear of the stranger. Someone who doesn't look like us, walk like us, talk like us, doesn't have as much money as us, we are going to be challenged as the people of God. What will we do when the stranger comes in the room? Welcome them. Mm. And what does that look like? There was a picture that probably those of you who watched MSNBC yesterday will see that there was a group of persons from Central America who were crossing the border coming to America. Children and women and probably adult male children boys coming across the world. And what this wonderful picture had is that they were walking north, probably. And the Border Patrol asked them a very simple question. Kind of like, and they asked, kind of, where are we? And they found out that they were in the United States. There was a smile that came over their face. And we can go to the road, the rules and say, how did they get across the border? How did they, whatever. Whatever your issue may be, the question simply came now is how do we treat the undocumented persons who came across the border? Right. How do you and I treat each other? Because that is going to be an important testament to who we are as people today. Right. Mm -hmm. You see, when freedom comes, it means all of us again working together. It is going to strain us, it's going to make us feel uncomfortable but it is how we live out our faith. In short, I believe the Great Commission that simply says, go ye and make disciples, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey is going to be you and I's 21st century, 21st century challenge of again when freedom comes and so many different, when people come looking for freedom, and you and I have the opportunity to offer it. It comes because you and I become the voice the voice of justice, who could go to the various places, the justice systems, to the various uh, representatives, and make it case to treat people humanely. Yes. It will mean that, yes, we're baptizing them not in the name of our traditions and our faith and our traditions. It means we are here to baptize them, removing their fears and concerns about what it is to be treated as a human being, even if they don't have document papers, Undocumented, <coughs> even if their skin color is different than ours. And you and I would probably say, well, I can't do that. What do you mean, go? Go somewhere and do it. There's a misnomer that sometimes says, does that mean I'm supposed to become a missionary, leave my place of home, and go across the ocean and become that <coughs> person who becomes that voice? I don't believe the Great Commission spoke about that. I believe the person which Jesus was simply said, where you go in your own community, Wherever you are, you are a representative of who God is. And so where you go, in the nightclub, in the market, wherever you are, go and again be that voice of justice. That's yes. right. But when you go, the latter part is, who do you go? You don't go and just say it's all about Omeda. That sounds good. But you go in the name of what is holy to you. It says, yes, about the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. It could be the creator of Jesus and the Holy Spirit. But whatever it is, you and I go. You see, I think in short, modern day slavery <coughs> exists in many forms. But the good news is that when freedom comes, it comes, yes, as a law. But the true gift is when the faith community, again, demonstrates and lives it out. And is willing to step forward and says, let me help you. Not because I fully understand all the laws, but simply because you are a child of God. And so for me, what Ju Juneteenth means, it is a way, it is a unifier. It is a way to remind us that the ugly about ourselves can become the beautiful. It is a way that allows us to forgive us, forgive ourselves, and to move forward. It is a way for you and I to free God's people from the various shackles of the world, those laws and those confinements that the world does. When freedom comes, be a voice and a place of love and liberation, not only for a couple, but for all of God's children. Amen. Amen. Amen.